on the social element in religion by frederick schleiermacher 1768 to 1834 published in 1799 translated by george ripley this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org those among you who are accustomed to regard religion as a disease of the human mind cherish also the habitual conviction that it is an evil more easily borne even though not to be cured so long as it is only insulated individuals here and there who are infected with it but that the common danger is raised to the highest degree and everything put at stake as soon as a too close connection is permitted between many patients of this character in the former case it is probably by a judicious treatment as it were by an antiphlegistic regimen and by a healthy spiritual atmosphere to ward off the violence of the paroxysms and if not entirely to conquer the exciting cause of the disease to attenuate it to such a degree that it shall be almost innocuous but in the latter case we must despair of every other means of cure except that which would proceed from some internal beneficent operation of nature for the evil is attended with more alarming symptoms and is more fatal in its effects when the too great proximity of other infected persons feeds and aggravates it in every individual the whole mass of vital air is then quickly poisoned by a few the most vigorous frames are smitten with the contagion all the channels in which the functions of life should go on are destroyed all the juices of the system are decomposed and seized with a similar feverish delirium the sound spiritual life and productions of whole ages and nations are involved in irremediable ruin hence our antipathy to the church to every institution which is intended for the communication of religion is always more prominent than that which you feel to religion itself hence also priests as the pillars and the most efficient members of such institutions are of all men the objects of your greatest abomination even those among you who hold a little more indulgent opinion with regard to religion and deem it rather a singularity than a disorder of the mind an insignificant rather than a dangerous phenomenon cherish quite as unfavorable impressions of all social organizations for its promotion a slavish immolation of all that is free and peculiar a system of lifeless mechanisms and barren ceremonies these they imagine are the inseparable consequences of every such institution and are the ingenious and elaborate work of men who with almost incredible success have made a great merit of things which are either nothing in themselves or which any other person was quite as capable of accomplishing as they i should pour out my heart but very imperfectly before you on a subject to which i attach the utmost importance if i did not undertake to give you the correct point of view with regard to it i need not here repeat how many of the perverted endeavors and melancholy fortunes of humanity you charge upon religious associations this is clear as light in a thousand utterances of your predominant individuals nor will i stop to refute these accusations one by one in order to fix the evil upon other causes let us rather submit the whole conception of the church to a new examination and from its central point throughout its whole extent erect it again upon a new basis without regard to what it has actually been hitherto or to what experience may suggest concerning it 
if religion exists at all it must needs possess a social character this is founded not only in the nature of man but still more in the nature of religion you will acknowledge that it indicates a state of disease a signal perversion of nature when an individual wishes to shut up within himself anything which he has produced and elaborated by his own efforts it is the disposition of man to reveal and to communicate whatever is in him in the indispensable relations and mutual dependence not only of practical life but also of his spiritual being by which he is connected with all others of his race and the more powerfully he is wrought upon by anything the more deeply it penetrates his inward nature so much the stronger is this social impulse even if we regard it only from the point of view of the universal endeavor to behold the emotions which we feel ourselves as they are exhibited by others so that we may obtain a proof for their example that our experience is not beyond the sphere of humanity you perceive that i am not speaking here of the endeavor to make others similar to ourselves nor of the conviction that what is exhibited in one is essential to all it is merely my aim to ascertain the true relation between our individual life and the common nature of man and clearly to set it forth but the peculiar object of this desire for communication is unquestionably that in which man feels that he is originally passive namely his observations and emotions he is here impelled by the eager wish to know whether the power which has produced them in him is not something foreign and unworthy hence we see man employed from his early childhood in communicating these observations and emotions the conceptions of his understanding concerning whose origin there can be no doubt he allows to rest in his own mind and still more easily to determine to refrain from the expression of his judgments but whatever acts upon his senses whatever awakens his feelings of that he desires to obtain witnesses with regard to that he longs for those who will sympathize with him how should he keep to himself those very operations of the world upon his soul which are the most universal and comprehensive which appear to him as of the most stupendous and resistless magnitude how should he be willing to lock up within his own bosom those very emotions which impel him with the greatest power beyond himself and in the indulgence of which he becomes conscious that he can never understand his own nature from himself alone it will rather be his first endeavor whenever a religious view gains clearness in his eye or a pious feeling penetrates his soul to direct the attention of others to the same object and as far as possible to communicate to their hearts the elevated impulses of his own if then the religious man is urged by his nature to speak it is the same nature which secures to him the certainty of hearers there is no element of his being with which at the same time there is implanted in man such a lively feeling of his total inability to exhaust it by himself alone as with that of religion a sense of religion has no sooner dawned upon him than he feels the infinity of its nature and the limitation of his own he is conscious of embracing but a small portion of it and that which he cannot immediately reach he wishes to perceive as far as he can from the representations of others who have experienced it themselves and to enjoy it with them hence he is anxious to observe every manifestation of it and seeking to supply his own deficiencies he watches for every tone which he recognizes as proceeding from it in this manner mutual communications are instituted 
in this manner every one feels equally the need both of speaking and hearing but the imparting of religion is not to be sought in books like that of intellectual conceptions and scientific knowledge the pure impression of the original product is too far destroyed in this medium which in the same way that dark-colored objects absorb the greatest proportion of the rays of light swallows up everything belonging to the pious emotions of the heart which cannot be embraced in the insufficient symbols from which it is intended again to proceed nay in the written communications of religious feeling everything needs a double and triple representation for that which originally represented must be represented in its turn and yet the effect on the whole man in its complete unity can only be imperfectly set forth by continued and varied reflections it is only when religion is driven out from the society of the living that it must conceal its manifold life under the dead letter neither can the intercourse of heart with heart on the deepest feelings of humanity be carried on in common conversation many persons who are filled with zeal for the interests of religion have brought it as a reproach against the manners of our age that while all other important subjects are so freely discussed in the intercourse of society so little should be said concerning god and divine things i would defend ourselves against this charge by maintaining that this circumstance at least does not indicate contempt or indifference toward religion but a happy and very correct instinct in the presence of joy and merriment where earnestness itself must yield to raillery and wit there can be no place for that which should be always surrounded with holy veneration and awe religious views pious emotions and serious considerations with regard to them these we cannot throw up to one another in such small crumbs as the topics of light conversation and when the discourse turns upon sacred subjects it should rather be a crime than a virtue to have an answer ready for every question and a rejoinder for every remark hence the religious sentiment retires from such circles as are too wide for it to the more confidential intercourse of friendship and to the mutual communications of love where the eye and the countenance are more expressive than words and where even a holy silence is understood but it is impossible for divine things to be treated in the usual manner of society where the conversation consists in striking flashes of thought gaily and rapidly alternating with one another a more elevated style is demanded for the communication of religion and a different kind of society which is devoted to this purpose must hence be formed it is becoming indeed to apply the whole richness and magnificent of human discourse to the loftiest subject which language can reach not as if there were any adornment with which religion could not dispense but because it would show a frivolous and unholy disposition in the heralds if they did not bring together the most copious resources within their power and consecrate them all to religion so that they might thus perhaps exhibit it in its appropriate greatness and dignity hence it is impossible without the aid of poetry to give utterance to the religious sentiment in any other than an oratorical manner with all the skill and energy of language and freely using in addition the service of all the arts which can contribute to flowing and impassioned discourse he therefore whose heart is overflowing with religion can open his mouth only before an auditory where that which is presented with such a wealth of preparation can produce the most extended and manifold effects 
would that i could present before you an image of the rich and luxurious life in this city of god when its inhabitants come together each in the fullness of his own inspiration which is ready to stream forth without constraint but at the same time each is filled with a holy desire to receive and to appropriate to himself everything which others wish to bring before him if one comes forward before the rest it is not because he is entitled to this distinction in virtue of an officer or of a previous agreement nor because pride and conceitedness have given him presumption it is rather a free impulse of the spirit a sense of the most heartfelt unity of each with all a consciousness of entire equality a mutual renunciation of all first and last of all the arrangements of earthly order he comes forward in order to communicate to others as an object of sympathizing contemplation the deepest feelings of his soul while under the influence of god to lead them to the domain of religion in which he breathes his native air and to infect them with the contagion of his own holy emotions he speaks forth the divine which stirs his bosom and in holy silence the assembly follows the inspiration of his words whether he unveils a secret mystery or with prophetic confidence connects the future with the present whether he strengthens old impressions by new examples or is led by the lofty visions of his burning imagination into other regions of the world and into other order of things the practice sense of his audience everywhere accompanies his own and when he returns into himself from his wanderings through the kingdom of god his own heart and that of each of his hearers are the common dwelling place of the same emotion if now the agreement of his sentiments with that which they feel be announced to him whether loudly or low then are holy mysteries not merely significant emblems but justly regarded natural indications of a peculiar consciousness and peculiar feelings invented and celebrated a higher choir as it were which in its own lofty language answers to the appealing voice but not only so to speak for such a discourse is music without tune or measure so there is also a music among the holy which may be called discourse without words the most distinct and expressive utterance of the inward man the muse of harmony whose intimate relation with religion although it has been for a long time spoken of and described is yet recognized only by few has always presented upon her altars the most perfect and magnificent productions of her selectest scholars in honor of religion it is in sacred hymns and choirs with which the words of the poet are connected only by slight and airy bands that these feelings are breathed forth which precise language is unable to contain and thus the tones of thought and emotion alternate with each other in mutual support until all is satisfied and filled with the holy and the infinite of this character is the influence of religious men upon one another such as their natural and eternal union do not take it ill of them that this heavenly bond the most consummate product of the social nature of man but to which it does not attain until it becomes conscious of its own high and peculiar significance that this should be deemed of more value in their sight than the political union which you esteem so far above everything else but which will nowhere ripen to manly beauty and which compared to the former appears far more constrained than free far more transitory than eternal
but where now in the description which i have given of the community of the pious is that distinction between priests and laymen which you are accustomed to designate as a source of so many evils a false appearance has deceived you this is not a distinction between persons but only one of condition and performance every man is a priest so far as he draws others around him into the spheres which he has appropriated to himself and in which he professes to be a master every one is a layman so far as he is guided by the counsel and experience of another within the sphere of religion where he is comparatively a stranger there is not here the tyrannic aristocracy which you describe with such hatred but this society is a priestly people a perfect republic where every one is alternately ruler and citizen where every one follows the same power in another which he feels also in himself and with which he too governs others how then could the spirit of discord and division which you regard as the inevitable consequence of all religious combinations find a congenial home within this sphere i see nothing but that all is one and that all the differences which actually exist in religion by means of this very union of the pious are gently blended with one another i have directed your attention to the different degrees of religiousness i have pointed out to you the different modes of insight and the different directions in which the soul seeks for itself the supreme object of its pursuit do you imagine that this must needs give birth to sex and thus destroy all free and reciprocal intercourse in religion it is true indeed in contemplation that everything which is separated into various parts and embraced in different divisions must be opposed and contradictory to itself but consider i pray you how life is manifested in a great variety of forms how the most hostile elements seek out one another here and for this very reason what we separate in contemplation all flows together in life they to be sure who on one of these points bear the greatest resemblance to one another will present the strongest mutual attraction and they cannot on that account compose an independent whole for the degrees of this affinity imperceptibly diminish and increase and in the midst of so many transitions there is no absolute repulsion no total separation even between the most discordant elements take what you will of these masses which have assumed an organic form according to their own inherent energy if you do not forcibly divide them by a mechanical operation no one will exhibit an absolutely distinct and homogeneous character but the extreme points of each will be connected at the same time with those which display different properties and properly belong to another mass if the pious individuals who stand on the same degree of a lower order form a closer union with one another there are yet some always included in the combination who have a presentiment of higher things these are better understood by all who belong to the higher social class than they understand themselves and there is a point of sympathy between the two which is concealed only from the latter if those combine in whom one of the modes of insight which i have described is predominant there will always be some among them who understand at least both the modes and since they in some degree belong to both they form a connecting link between two spheres which would otherwise be separated thus the individual who is more inclined to cherish a religious connection between himself and nature is yet by no means opposed in the essentials of religion to him who prefers to trace the footsteps of the godhead in history and there will never be wanting those who can pursue both paths with equal facility 
thus in whatever manner you divide the vast province of religion you will always come back to the same point if unbounded universality of insight be the first and original supposition of religion and hence also most naturally its fairest and ripest fruit you perceive that it cannot be otherwise than that in proportion as an individual advances in religion and the character of his piety becomes more pure the whole religious world will more and more appear to him as an indivisible whole the spirit of separation in proportion as it insists upon a rigid division is a proof of imperfection the highest and most cultivated minds always perceive a universal connection and for the very reason that they perceive it they also establish it since every one comes in contact only with his immediate neighbor but at the same time has an immediate neighbor on all sides and in every direction he is in fact indissolubly linked in with the whole mystics and naturalists in religion they too whom the godhead is a personal being and they to whom it is not they who have arrived at a systematic view of the universe and they who behold it only in its elements or only in obscure chaos all notwithstanding should be only one for one band surrounds them all and they can be totally separated only by a violent and arbitrary force every specific combination is nothing but an integral part of the whole its peculiar characteristics are almost evanescent and are gradually lost in outlines that become more and more indistinct and at least those who feel themselves thus united will always be the superior portion whence then but through a total misunderstanding have arisen that wild and disgraceful zeal for proselytism to a separate and peculiar form of religion and that horrible expression no salvation except with us as i have described to you the society of the pious and as it must needs be according to its intrinsic nature it aims merely at reciprocal communication and subsists only between those who are already in possession of religion of whatever character it may be how then can it be its vocation to change the sentiments of those who now acknowledge a definite system or to introduce and consecrate those who are totally destitute of one the religion of this society as such consists only in the religion of all the pious taken together as each one beholds it in the rest it is infinite no single individual can embrace it entirely since so far as it is individual it ceases to be one and hence no man can attain such elevation and completeness as to raise himself to its level if any one then has chosen a part in it for himself whatever it may be were it not an absurd procedure for society to wish to deprive him of that which is adapted to his nature since it ought to comprise this also within its limits and hence some one must needs possess it and to what end should it desire to cultivate those who are yet strangers to religion its own especial characteristic the infinite whole of course it cannot impart to them and the communication of any specific element cannot be accomplished by the whole but only by individuals but perhaps then the universal the indeterminate which might be presented when we seek that which is common to all the members yet you are aware that as a general rule nothing can be given or communicated in the form of the universal and indeterminate for specific object and precise form are requisite for this purpose otherwise in fact that which is presented would not be a reality but a nullity 
such a society accordingly can never find a measure or rule for this undertaking and how could it so far abandon its sphere as to engage in this enterprise the need on which it is founded the essential principle of religious sociability points to no such purpose individuals unite with one another and compose a whole the whole rests in itself and needs not to strive for anything beyond hence whatever is accomplished in this way for religion is the private affair of the individual for himself and if i may say so more in his relations out of the church than in it compelled to descend to the lower grounds of life from the circle of religious communion where the mutual existence of life in god afford him the most elevated enjoyment and where his spirit penetrated with holy feelings soars to the highest summit of consciousness it is his consolation that he can connect everything with which he must there be employed with that which always retains the deepest significance in his heart as he descends from such lofty regions to those whose whole endeavor and pursuit are limited to earth he easily believes and you must pardon him the feeling that he has passed from intercourse with gods and muses to a race of coarse barbarians he feels like a steward of religion among the unbelieving a herald of piety among the savages he hopes like an orpheus or an amphion to charm the multitude with his heavenly tones he presents himself among them like a priestly form clearly and brightly exhibiting the lofty spiritual sense which fills his soul in all his actions and in the whole compass of his being if the contemplation of the holy and the godlike awakens a kindred emotion in them how joyful does he cherish the first presages of religion in a new heart and a delightful pledge of its growth even in a harsh and foreign clime with what triumph does he bear the neophyte with him to the exalted assembly this action for the promotion of religion is only the pious yearning of the stranger after his home the endeavor to carry his fatherland with him in all his wanderings and everywhere to find again its laws and customs as the highest and most beautiful elements of his life but the fatherland itself happy in its own resources perfectly sufficient for its own wants knows no such endeavor end of on the social element in religion by Frederick Schleiermacher, published in 1799.